Yeah. Hard work, the wrong philosophy equals bankruptcy. Yeah. Hard work, the wrong philosophy equals enthusiastically running in the wrong direction. And that's a Peter Drucker quote, right? And, and he says, there's nothing worse than doing something that didn't need to be done at all. Yeah. And so there's a lot of people working hard and not getting further ahead. As a matter of fact, that keeps them in activity and consumption, working hard and then justifying the hard work with what they buy that puts them in a situation they have to work harder just to pay that. Yeah. And they stay stuck on that hamster wheel. Welcome to the Men's Midlife Revolution Online Summit. I'm your host, Tim Corcoran, and today my guest is Garrett Gunderson. What's going on, Tim? Hey, man. Good to see you. So Garrett tackles the critically important topics of financial growth, success, and prosperity that are all too often neglected, mostly due to painfully boring presenters in the field. He's the founder of an Inc. 500 firm and author of multiple Wall Street Journal bestselling books, as well as the hit New York Times bestseller, Killing Sacred Cows. Garrett is a regular on ABC's Good Money. He's been interviewed by Neil Cavuto on Fox, was kicked off CNBC, which would be a great story to hear. Yeah. <laughs> uh, has been featured in over a thousand radio interviews, guest on hundreds of podcasts, and is also a paid contributor for Forbes. Beyond this, he's spoken at MIT multiple times. They, as they say, if you want to transform your thoughts into profits, keep way more of what you make, keep and grow your money without sacrifice or delay, Garrett is your guy. So welcome here, Garrett. It's great to have you here on the summit. Well, uh, you did a great job with that bio, man. Uh, first off, some people call it, like when they're reading, they read too quickly, they call it killing scared crows, which just sounds atrociously mean, you know? <laughs> I don't know how to do with anything. Right. So yeah. you nailed that. And uh, yeah, the CNBC thing was actually on a Christmas Eve. Uh, I was on the program yeah. and uh, they said it was actually December of 2008. So you can you know, imagine it's right in the midst of where it were in the early parts of this recession. And I say, sure. I go, What's, you know, what are some good uh, investments to, to get into? And I go, well, definitely not the stock market. I would cash out if you're in that right now. And they cut to commercial and uh, everything went dead and I never heard back from them. So, wow. Yeah. Okay. Right there. <laughs> yeah. And then one of my buddies who used to work on wall street, he was, he was working out in New York, watching CNBC calls me. He's like, dude, did you see that guy's face? I'm like, no, man, I'm looking into a camera. I'm just in a feed. Right. Right. Because his eyes were so big. And then they, he's like, it was awkward. And they just cut to commercial. I was like, <laughs> ah, they, they should have known what they were getting with me, man. I'm not going to hold anything back. Right. Exactly. Well, that's awesome. So, so listen, before we dive in, I really want to speak to our, our summit audience right now yeah. and let them know why it was so important to me to have you on this summit, right? Um, for me, you know, having a healthy, thriving relationship with money and finances is something that didn't come easy to me, right? Like growing up, like many, money wasn't spoken about much in my household. And by the time I was a young man, I had a lot of unconscious financial habits in place. Um, so I got by for a while, right? But as happens, you know, about 10 years ago, um, it all pretty much came to a crash for me, right? When I found myself maxed out in credit card debt, despite directing an otherwise uh, thriving uh, visionary business and organization, my wilderness school. So that was the point for me, Garrett, when it all changed, you know, when I realized, okay, um, I have got to take a look inside. I've got to take a look at what's my relationship with money. What's my, what are my habits? What are my beliefs that are holding me back from really thriving? And, you know, if I want to live this life fully, if I want to fully express my purpose, I've got to have a solid relationship with money and finances. So that's where I stand now, you know, much better place financially than I was 10 years ago, gratefully. And your advice, you know, even if it was just online and articles and whatnot has actually been really supportive in my path. And so right. that's what I want for our audience, right? I want them to have that healthy, thriving relationship with finances, with money, um, to clear whatever limiting beliefs they've got going on, really that they can step into real prosperity. A lot of those limiting beliefs are subconscious. They come from, you know, uh, well-intentioned family, friends, preachers, and teachers. They're, they're conversations we overhear. They're situations that we watch. You know, I think of like when I was a kid waking up, we were camping once and I woke up and, and my family and you know, my parents were outside and there was a little plaque on the trailer that said, 
money's the root of all evil with the little devil. I remember looking at that, being kind of scared. I remember sitting down under the table once just you know, with my blanket as a little kid and my mom's crying at the table and I'm like, what's going on? And she's like, oh, we're insurance poor. All of our money goes to insurance companies. I'm like, those SOBs, right? Like those kind of moments when you see real emotion for people that you care about, that kind of gets programmed, whether it's, you know, accurate or inaccurate. And uh, I feel like some, to a large degree, we're kind of tribal beings. And so what, what does it say if we confront that? If we change our own belief about that, um, you know, like I've heard my grandma say, oh yeah, he made a bunch of money because he's just a bad person. You know, I remember that on a drive once pointing something out. And so these little things can kind of slip in. And, and so fortunately, I've just been inquisitive enough and curious enough. And I also just saw the footprints that were left in my family from my great grandfather leaving his wife for seven years to build a life where they could afford a home and bringing her over from Italy. And then that trapping of scarcity that got imprinted throughout the family, it was all about sacrificing and scrimping and delaying and deferring and that everything about money was complicated or risky and that they just didn't have the courage to confront it and just have to hold on to it. And, and you know, like I just fortunately asked enough questions, got in the right relationships and I'm helping change that from a generational standpoint, not only in my family, but really out there in the world because scarcity is the greatest destroyer of wealth. No amount of luck or saving or discipline or ready to return or financial advisor can save someone if they're in scarcity because fear, doubt, and worry start to lie. They're thieves of joy. They're, they move us further away from value creation. They tend to create that, that selfishness that actually, you know, it, it, it dispel, it like kind of moves wealth away. And so like the good news is what we think is complicated about money, a lot of times we don't even need to know. And that there's a lot of people that tell us it takes money to make money because they want our money or the high risk equals high return because you're taking risk while they get the return. And so if we can cut to the bottom line and say, what are simple things that once you understand can help you to have a better life? What if you understood that prosperity was a function of value creation? Well, that dispels the notion of money being evil or wrong and instead just being a byproduct of the best you have to bring to the world. And I strongly believe that all the, the problems that we face in the world, we actually have the resources and human beings to solve those problems, but because of the confusion around money, because of the, the lack of understanding of principles of prosperity, that the world never sees that, and therefore these problems are exacerbated. Yeah, and I, I love that point that you're saying that money and financial wealth and prosperity is an expression of value creation, right? For me, uh, as, a, as a purpose coach, a purpose guide, someone who helps individuals connect with their purpose, oftentimes what I see, and I know I had this for a while, is that same belief. Money is the root of all evil. You know, it's greedy. It's horrible. It's going to ruin me. It's going to ruin you. And yet that's a huge one right there, right? I mean, that's, that's huge. Right. And like, you know, I think that I think where money becomes problematic mm -hmm. um, and it becomes instead of an ally and an asset, it becomes kind of an enemy is when people try to hoard it, when people look to have it regardless of what they're creating or when they feel entitled to it. And and so unfortunately, kind of the notion that's came about for people is that money is a function of three factors. Number one, how much can you how much can you get? right? Number two, how much can you earn on that money by taking unnecessary risk? And number three, can you wait extraordinary amounts of time for that to one day, someday pay off? And unfortunately, they lose the momentum along the way. Mm -hmm. And they're being taught a set of rules that the institutions aren't following, like the institutions aren't waiting for 30 years for a retirement plan to fund. Instead, they're creating cash flow today. Mm -hmm. And so I would say instead of trying to accumulate or wait for 30 years, what if instead it was about, I'll say it this way, it's so simple. Instead of looking at living within your means mm -hmm. as a way of cutting back and eliminating and reducing because no one shrinks their way to wealth, what if we looked at two other factors? Mm -hmm. One is being more efficient, which means plugging the leaks, which means keeping more of what you make because you're not tipping the government, because yep. you're not overpaying on insurance costs that aren't providing benefit or you don't have hidden fees or commissions that are creating drag on your investments that don't provide a rate of return, or overpaying on interest because you don't have the right structure to your loans or methodologies to lower interest rates or structure those things in a way that benefits you versus the institution. So like 
we could be more efficient within our means and then that boosts the bottom line. And I think that that's by 10% or more without having a coupon clip or cut out. And then finally, another piece is to expand our means. Expanding your means means delivering more value, impacting more people, more deeply impacting the people you currently serve. And in doing that, dollars are a byproduct of that, that value creation or dollars follow value. So you can expand your means, be more efficient within your means, or you can get stuck in a budgetary reductionist mindset, which is all about elimination, which once again will not lead to sustainable, enjoyable wealth. Yes, you might be able to become the millionaire next door, but you'll be broke and miserable trying to get there. And unfortunately, if you have kids, they'll probably just waste the money after you die within 16 months because it was never understood, never talked about. And so there are better methods and they are simple. It doesn't mean that you have to know about tax liens or options trading. It doesn't mean you have to be an expert in real estate or the stock market. What you do have to recognize is you are your greatest asset, not some stock, bond, or piece of real estate. And if you can understand that and invest in yourself and find ways to build foundational pieces to protect and transfer risk and then increase your ability to make money, then learn how to keep more of the money that you make without cutting back and eventually become a better investor that focuses more on cash flow than accumulation, you will win the game. You will absolutely win the game. Beautiful, beautiful. I mean, so many important points in there. So let's just, I mean, let's start with, uh, with wealth and prosperity. I'd love to hear, Garrett, your definitions. How do you define wealth? How do you define prosperity? All right, so I'm gonna give four definitions here. Yeah. I'm gonna give a definition of wealth, prosperity, financial freedom, and economic independence, because having a distinction of these four things, I think can be instrumental. Great. So I think there's a difference between being rich and being wealthy. Being rich means you have a lot of money. That's being rich. And there's people that can have a lot of money and they're corrupt a-holes and there's people that have a lot of money and they're pretty happy. It's, it's, it's an ingredient, it's not the recipe. So being wealthy comes down to five tracks. There's five tracks to wealth and this isn't about balance, it's about depth and harmony. Depth means presence. It means intentionality. Harmony means you're designing it in a way that you're orchestrating and being the author of it rather than it happening to you. So that would be my definition. So the five tracks of wealth are finance. So, you know, money is an important part of society unless you're going to permanently live in the wilderness with a loincloth and a bow and arrow. And then fine, money's probably not that important at that point. Sure. The second thing is purpose. Like when people don't have purpose, they tend to be miserable. They tend to be sad. They tend to be misguided, right? So purpose is essential to wealth. And the third piece is mindset. Our mentality is essential wealth because you could have all the money in the world, but if you have scarcity, you're never going to feel wealthy. Right. The next piece is health, right? Or our physical well-being. Someone without their health would probably give all their money just to have that health back, right? And then finally, social. So the social aspect of wealth is relaxation, rejuvenation, and recreation. If all you do is work and have no hobbies, if all you do is work yourself where you get diminishing returns and you're exhausted and you lose relationships, it's not really well. So we have, we have finance, purpose, mindset, health, and then we have the social aspect. Those are the five tracks of wealth. And it's being intentional about it. And it doesn't mean you're perfectly balanced. It just means that you have that presence and that you know what you're doing. Okay, now of prosperity. Beautiful. Okay, so prosperity, I have an equation for prosperity, okay? And in this equation is we take our perspective, okay, our perspective, which is how we view the world, and then we add our purpose. So when our perspective comes from abundance, which is governed by innovation, ingenuity, and inspiration versus scarcity, which is governed by fear, doubt, and worry. So we take that perspective, then we combine purpose, which narrows it down to say, what is it that we're up to, right? And then we multiply that by um, production, production is an action that we take based upon that perspective and that purpose to bring it into the reality of the world. Yeah. That's what prosperity comes from. Yeah. So, right. So, so that's a definition of prosperity. Now, financial freedom, financial freedom is something that's been abused and bastardized in the world because there's no amount of money you can have an account and have financial freedom. Financial freedom is a mindset. It's a perspective. Mm -hmm. And it's one where money's no longer the primary reason or excuse why you do or don't do something. I'll say that again. It's where money's not the primary reason or excuse why you would do or not do something. It's a consideration, just not the consideration. So if I were to boil that down, let's break it down into three parts. In measuring worth, there's the price, 
There's the cost and there's the value. Price is what we pay. Cost is the economic impact and value is the overall feeling of satisfaction and joy we have. So people that are not financially free focus on price and they overemphasize it. They maybe look to do whatever they can to lower the price, to have savings, to coupon clip, to budget, to scrimp, to save, right? Cost looks at the economics behind it. Mm -hmm. So I can have something that is low price, high cost. Like if I were able to get on an airplane for a dollar because they decided they didn't want to worry about maintenance or training their pilots, sure, the price is low, but I'm going to be dead at the first sign of turbulence, right? So it's low price, high cost. On the other hand, I have an amazing accounting team. They're higher priced than most people, but the cost is lower because of the amount of tax that I save and the peace of mind that I have. Mm -hmm. Now, value, I just recently took my family to Italy. And, uh, and when I say my family, it's actually my parents and my siblings, not my wife and kids. Mm -hmm. And on the, on the flight home, we were flying home on New Year's Eve. I wanted to be able to have energy to stay up till New Year's. And, you know, we're going back to see our, our spouses and everything. And so I, I got us first class. Right now, first class was more expensive, but you know what? It was my dad's favorite trip that he's ever taken was just first class because it's lay down seats. They're bringing an ice cream cart. You know, there there's every movie you could ever imagine. He just felt like a king for 10 hours flying back from Amsterdam. And so like, yeah, the value was so high that it outweighed the cost and the price. Yep. It just did, you know, but for other people that might not be valuable. Other people might say, I don't even care. I wouldn't want to travel. I, I don't, that's not even my thing, but but if we begin with value first as the first consideration, cost is the second consideration and price is the third, that's from a financially free mind. That's what a financially free mind does. Now, economic independence is when we have enough cash flow coming in from one of two sources, assets that kick off recurring revenue or entrepreneurial income, which is the income that comes in even if you're not working that day. So that comes from scale or leverage or automation, right? You still have to monitor it, you're still managing it, but not moment to moment. And when we have cash flow coming from that to cover our basic expenses in life, that's economic independence. Financial freedom is a state of mind. Economic independence is a state of assets producing cash flow. When you're economically independent, you get to have more freedom and choice day to day because you're not forced to pay the bills due to your daily actions. So now we have the definition of wealth, five tracks. We have the definition of prosperity with perspective and purpose combined with production. And then we have the definition of financial freedom, where money is no longer the primary reason or excuse we do or don't do something. And then economic independence, enough cash flow to cover our basic expenses. Just having that definitionally allows us to have different targets, different understanding. Therefore, we have an awareness that can create different actions. And, and with those different actions, you can get better results because we don't have to wait 30 years for economic independence. We can have that within three to 10 years simply by having the right methodologies and frameworks. Beautiful. Oh my gosh. You are so good at packing so much in a short period of time. You know, what the big pieces I'm, I'm hearing that are touching for me, my, my takeaways here is your holistic, a your holistic definition of wealth, right? I mean, that's a huge one. Here you are focused on your whole life's work. Garrett is focused on, on building wealth and right off the bat, you're defining it as, yeah, it's way more than just money. And I think that's so much of what turns so many people off, right, from diving into the world of finances and money is they think everyone's just got blinders on and they're just focused on the dollar sign. So I'm, I'm really appreciating that holistic perspective. And then, yes, uh, the point on value, right, so key. You know, what value am I providing the world tied in with purpose again? And then as well, what, it, what do I value, right? right. And how can I bring that to myself in a good way that supports myself, my family, my community, my organizations, ultimately the, the world at large. Um, so I can really be my best self. So that's, that's beautiful, man. Love it. Um, okay. So let's take a look at this subset of the population, right? Men in midlife right now. Uh, how do we define that? Maybe what mid thirties to mid fifties, give or take. I mean, some people talk about midlife crisis even happening as early as 30 or even later, but generally right. Men in midlife. Why do you feel Garrett that, that this is a part a particularly unique time uh, and subset of the population that, that has a unique op and what's the unique opportunity really that men in midlife transitions have when it comes to building wealth, building prosperity. This is my viewpoint on it. We are lied to from the time we're young unintentionally 
from our loved ones and very intentionally from the bigger picture. So this is what it is. If you do these things, you can checklist these boxes. If you checklist these boxes, you're going to have a good life. And what happens is people go through that checklist. And when they get there, there's still something missing. And part of the reason something's missing is because society tries to define success for us based upon two things, activity and consumption. Mm -hmm. Stay busy. If you're busy enough, you can buy these things. If you buy these things, you can prove that you're worth something. You could prove that you're lovable. You could prove that that teacher that said something bad about you in third grade was wrong. You could, like, and so we're out there. And it's unfortunately this context of more, M-O-R-E. More is an unwinnable game because no matter how much more you have, there's more to have. No matter how much you have, someone else has more. So it's this ever, you know, elusive target. And so no matter how big of the home that you buy, no matter what awards you get, no matter what designations there are, if you're not living your purpose defined by who you are and what speaks to you, there's nothing that can replace that. Mm -hmm. And so if we look at where this even came from, yeah. I feel like Edward Bernays has been instrumental at creating a consumptionistic, consumeristic, I don't know if consumptionistic is a word, consumeristic society. This consumeristic society was sex sells, right? So let's, let's say if you drive this car, then you can get this woman. And if you have this thing, then other people will envy you and all this kind of stuff. And so Edward Bernays was the nephew of Sigmund Freud. And so he was hired by all these people, whether it was the presidents of the United States, almost all of them, whether it was Ford Motor Company. And so an example is there was a time where only like 2% of women were smoking. And so the tobacco companies hired him. And what he did is he, he didn't like the term propaganda. So he renamed propaganda public relations. That's, he's the founder of the term public relations. And so one of the things he did is during one of these New York parades, he brought these women that wore garter and garters and they put cigarettes in there and they walked the parade and they were the freedom lighters. So they lit up the cigarettes and within two years, 49% of smokers were women right? Because he understood how to initiate the propaganda of consumerism. So if we're stuck in someone else's definition of success, if we're trying to fulfill something that's an unfillable void, whether that's perfectionism, whether that's more, then we're not living life on our terms. We're living life in hopes that something else is going to make it work or make us happy. And ultimately, we hit that point in life where we're like, this just doesn't sing my song. This doesn't speak to me. This isn't who I am. And that's that midlife where we get to say, what's important? What really matters? Mm -hmm. And if we look back and say, what are the top days of our life? Those top days are typically not what we were told were going to be the top days, right? Like my top days had to do with watching my son in a play just absolutely crush it. And I'm going, whoa, that level of talent to me getting up on stage that same week and doing stand-up comedy, which was outside of my comfort zone to having an amazing date night with my wife that we stayed up the whole night laughing and talking and doing other things I wouldn't talk about on this podcast, right? So like that was, it wasn't the day that I got notification I hit New York Times and Inc. 500 in the same day. That wasn't, that wasn't there for me because it was kind of, it was like checking the list. Now, those things aren't bad hitting New York Times, hitting, hitting Inc. 500, but they, are, they just weren't as fulfilling as I thought they were going to be because it was all about getting somewhere versus enjoying the space in between versus creating a game worth winning versus being on a journey that I don't want to retire from. And when we get crystal clear about our purpose, there's nothing more powerful for our finances or fulfillment in life, but it has to be our purpose, not governed by trying to appease our parents, trying to appease our teachers or trying to appease even our preachers that a lot of times, don't know exactly what our sole purpose is. Our sole purpose is our values, our abilities, and our, our passions combined for the highest context of our living, and it's unique to us. So no one can tell us what it is. We have to discover it. We have to do that internal work, and no amount of money can compensate for that. No amount of success in societal terms and accolades can compensate for that because if we don't discover it, we don't become the best version of who we are. And look, sometimes... We're chasing what seems like opportunity, but it's merely a distraction from the, the things that really sing to who we are. So that's what I believe. 
Beautiful. I, I love it. I mean, there's so much overlap here. So the, the piece you're, you're mentioning here, Garrett, about always seeking more, it's huge. And, and really your perspective is, a, is, is really a, a spiritual one, right? That that more, A, doesn't exist. And the real uh, goal, what we're really seeking is inside of ourselves. You know, it's in our relationships, as you're saying, it's in our families, it's in our communities, it's in how we serve the world. And that would, you know, that's, that's what I like to share when, when people ask for a definition of purpose. What I share is that purpose is where, uh, and actually this was a theologian who, who shared this, Fred, Frederick Beekner said that uh, purpose is where our deepest, uh, what did he say? He said, it's where our deepest passion intersects with the world's deep hunger, right? So it's what brings us fully alive and meets the need, an authentic need out there in the world, right? Where that connects. Right, because I definitely have some passions that are better described as hobbies, yes. right? And they're fun. Yeah, yeah and they're I, fun. Right, I didn't fun. have hobbies in my 20s. I was busy working, right. you know? But like now I have this renaissance period of my life where I'm like, you know, I'm learning to do a lot more cooking. I'm, uh, you know, I've been, I got my whiskey sommelier and I've been doing whiskey tastings, which has been a lot of fun. You know, um, what else I got going? Like, I, I've, I'm an amateur barista. I've been taking a barista course. So when people come over and hang out, I'm making them oh great God. lattes. I, 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 get, I did my very best latte art for my wife this afternoon, as a matter wow. of fact accidental but i'll take it it was gorgeous it was like usually my latte art's like a three and a half out of ten this was like a 10 out of 10 like deserved to be taken a picture of but you know anyway like these things have kind of reinvigorated me that my downtime isn't watching a series on tv my downtime is learning a skill set that has nothing to do with monetization so when it is time to monetize something i'm relaxed refreshed rejuvenated and creative right so so that's been it's been fun it's been exciting I mean, I even, I bought this cabin and I've been learning to fish. I learned to tie flies, uh, mm-hmm. used a chainsaw for the first time last year. And ironically, man, is that I grew up in a small coal mining town and shunned all that. Now I'm just embracing that. <laughs> I mean, I used to drive a Bentley. Now I drive a truck and I love my truck more than any other vehicle I've ever driven, man. It's, it's awesome. Right. It's funny how it comes full circle, huh? Yeah. yeah. Learning, learning archery, you know. Got a got a, a bow a year ago. Starting, you know, it's just it's been a lot of fun, and and then I can still do all the things that are super productive in society as well, and really striking like what do I want my life to look like? Because I don't want to ever have a life I want to retire from. I don't want to go. Uh, when am I going to stop doing this? No, I want to. The day I die is the day that I stop creating value. And if we think that we're going to stop creating value because we're exhausted or tired, we're not living the right life along the way. And I know that's harsh to say, but it's true. No, that's, that's the truth right there, brother. That's the truth. I mean, and at the end of the day, everyone knows that. You know, at the end of the day, when there we are, laying in bed, closing our eyes, we're left with ourselves, right? And, and what, what did I actually do with myself? What did I do with myself this day? How did I serve? How did I show up? So this is great. So I want to go back to the piece on limiting beliefs, Garrett, because this is a huge one. It was definitely a huge one for me. I had my work I had to go through on this one to get to the level of success I'm at right now. And I'd love to hear your perspective. So here's my questions, right? Um, In my experience, many, if not most individuals have limiting beliefs when it comes to money and finances. So I'm curious if you agree with that. Everyone does. I I still have some that I'm not detected yet. I just, I just hit different ceilings, busted through them and continue to have this evolution. And as soon as someone thinks they've arrived, they're really in a dangerous spot. <laughs> Good point. So the, the, all, the, the beginner's mind, right? Always learning. Huge, hugely important mindset. Um, so what's your take on, I mean, we've spoken a little bit about this, but I'd love to hear you speak more as well on why are limiting beliefs so common? And specifically, what do people do? Uh, how do we identify our limiting beliefs? And how do we actually go about changing them? I mean, this is getting into the inner workings of who we are, our psyches and who we are as human beings, right? Because ultimately my belief is that it's those limiting beliefs that hold us back from having that thriving relationship with, with money and finances. So there's a couple of things we can detect limiting beliefs through. Yeah. The first is a dilemma. A dilemma would be there's, there's no solid solution. It would appear. So here's an example. Someone having too much money is bad. Well, how much is too much? 
too big of a house is bad. Well, how much is too much? Like, it's not measurable. It's a judgment that comes from a dilemma, right? Like, hey, I want more money, but I feel like money's bad. That's a dilemma. What we've got is somewhere there's misinformation, there's a lack of truth, there's not an acknowledgement of principle because of whatever is out there. So when you find yourself in a dilemma, you know that you've got stuck with some misinformation or myth. Uh, another thing is when we find ourselves in a selfish state. Mm. So a selfish state is where scarcity really thrives. An example of selfishness would be wanting something without having to actually earn it, you know, and, and like people don't full on think of theft, but ultimately, you know, they want to win the lottery. Look, man, that's not a principle. Like that's absolute gambling at the highest level. And it's truly just a tax on the poor. Um, it's way that it's the way that governments raise capital by saying, Hey, look, buy this ticket and you're going to win something. You're not going to win anything. Just, you know, get over it. You're not going to win anything. You've lost by playing that game. It's a losing game. So selfishness paradoxically prevents us from being wealthy because when we get into a mindset of victimhood, mm -hmm. of blame, mm -hmm. of jealousy and envy of any of this, we now are no longer aligned with principle and we're going to stay stuck because that selfishness blinds us to being a contributor because reductionist thinking, scarcity thinking, elimination thinking versus value creation. No one shrinks their way to wealth. So as soon as we stop thinking of others and merely think only of ourselves, I want to be clear about this. It doesn't mean that we neglect self-care. Uh -huh. Self-care is required to be of utmost value. And making sure that you win mm -hmm. is required for you to be sustainable. It's not sacrifice because in the world of religion, sacrifice means to make sacred. That's noble. That's great. Outside of that, it usually means giving up something greater for something lesser, which is ironic and asinine. And too many people are doing that, sacrificing life today for retirement, you know, sacrificing enjoyment because one day, someday, it doesn't mean that we recklessly spend. It means we've got to absolutely look to deliver more value, impact more people. And so discover the dilemmas. They leave footprints of failure and they leave footprints of, or they leave structures of inaction where you're in, in action because of that, because you feel conflicted, there's a there's misinformation. Like, look, Killing Sacred Cows was really, really good at this. Like, Killing Sacred Cows, the book I wrote, it did not put the pieces together. And if you look at the critiques of it, if you look at people that rate it low, they're like, there's not enough practical information. And I would agree, there's not practical steps in that book. What it is, is it's detecting nine of the most subtle lies that derail us from things that would bring sustainable success and prosperity to our lives. And without detecting them, they're so subtle. That's the thing is obvious lies we know to avoid. We know how to, we know how to navigate that. It's the subtle ones that have billions of dollars of marketing and other people that tell us that's what we're supposed to do that create kind of that, that difficulty. So that book's really good at determining what are the main things that hold us back and what are those things that kind of blind us to prosperity. So dilemmas and selfishness are going to be the biggest factors that kind of propagate that that negativity or that scarcity. Beautiful. So, and and I'm just I'm just loving how again you're bringing it back to the inner game, right? It's not all about the actions we take in the outer world. I mean, yes, ultimately those actions matter, but what are those actions based off of? They're based well, think about on, this. Yeah, hard work, the wrong philosophy equals bankruptcy. Yeah. Hard work, the wrong philosophy equals enthusiastically running in the wrong direction. And that's a Peter Drucker quote, right? And, and he says, there's nothing worse than doing something that didn't need to be done at all. Yep. And so there's a lot of people working hard and not getting further ahead. As a matter of fact, that keeps them in activity and consumption, working hard and then justifying the hard work with what they buy that puts them in a situation they have to work harder just to pay that. Yep. And they stay stuck on that hamster wheel. Yeah, exactly. Beautiful. So, I mean, your message is really the one of freedom for people. It's one of liberation, how we can get ourselves out of those hamster wheels, which is just so hugely important. Um, well, this is great. So um, all that said, I mean, I think we've done a good job establishing, all right, it's about the inner game. It's about your beliefs. You've got to be in right relationship to yourself and right relationship to money and finances. So once an individual is in that place, and of course you shared some great resources on, on how to take that further, um, what are the specific measurable, tangible steps that people can take to really build wealth and move towards real prosperity? 
Well, the, the simple things to do and don't discount the simplicity mm -hmm. because they're just elegant. And that elegance allows for very substantial effectiveness without having to have a Herculean effort. Yeah. So the first thing is you go to your bank and you set up a separate account, actually two separate accounts. The first one is a wealth capture account. The second one is a living wealthy account. These can be checking, savings or money market. They just can't be the same as your personal account mm -hmm. where you normally pay bills and spend money. Can't be the same as your business checking where you have payroll and you have a lot of expenses. What it does is it allows you to do the most simple thing, which is pay yourself first. Now, what I'm going to say is you want to automatically save and deliberately invest. Automatic savings is go to the bank and say, can I set up a separate account and automatically sweep a percentage of money into that account every time I make a deposit. That's the ideal. If they can't do that, will a payroll service that pays you send you two checks, one to one account, one to another. But what I want to do is automate that so you can build enough liquidity to have a peace of mind fund, enough cash on hand, at least six months that if you had a health challenge, a family challenge, a cash flow crunch, you've got staying power and you don't have to chase bad profits or create undue and unnecessary stress on you. Look, I get it. Checking savings money markets, they don't earn a high rate of return, but it's not about the return on the account. It's the return that you create with less stress. That's why it's a peace of mind fund. Yes. So in order to fund the peace of mind fund, step two is we look at the four eyes, the four eyes to efficiency, the IRS, interest, investments, and insurance. So the IRS is the majority of people are tipping the government, especially if you own a business, there's a lot of ways to navigate a business and pay less in tax legally and ethically. If you're getting a refund as a non-business owner from the government, it means you've given them an interest-free loan and then you can change your exemption so that money goes into your wealth capture account along the year rather than go into the IRS's account that you eventually get a sum of money in the future. But that's one. The second is, is interest. There's a lot of people that haven't renegotiated their interest rates within the last couple of years. And if you have a credit score of a 760 or above, you're typically going to be able to lower your interest rates, right? Or they haven't restructured loans where you can, if you had a paid off car, you could refinance that, pay off a higher interest rate credit card, lower your payments and improve your credit score, right? That would be another example. Or reallocation. You might have underperforming assets like a certificate of deposit or a mutual fund that's not doing well, or something like that, that you could cash out and pay off a higher interest rate loan and get an immediate guaranteed return with that savings and improve your cash flow. So those are examples in loans. Or when we go to investments, there's hidden fees, there's uh, admin and legal fees and, and non-performing fees that you might be paying a manager that doesn't outperform an exchange traded fund or, a, or an index fund. And so that's just dragging you down and small fees end up being huge dollars over time because it's not about like the difference between a hundred grand mm -hmm. earning 10% for 30 years, that grows to 1.74 million. If it only earns 9.2%, it grows to 1.4 million. So less than a percent in fees has substantial impact on your bottom line. And then that last eye of insurances, a lot of people have the wrong deductibles or improper structure, or, you know, they don't have combined policies from the same company to get multi-policy discounts, or they're insuring inconsequential things that cost a lot more money than they're needed. And so there's ways to structure that, even with the same companies you have, to keep more of what you make. So that can help you fund that entire wealth capture account without having to coupon clip or cut back or lower your lifestyle. So I said two accounts, right? One account's wealth capture. I've given ways to fund it. The second thing is a living wealthy account. Mm. A living wealthy account would say, if you've automatically figured out how to save 15% of your personal income, and especially after we've saved on the four I's, well, now I want you to save an extra 3% into a living wealthy account. The living wealthy account is simply, you're doing the right things for yourself by automatically saving money. Now, put some money away for you to have value-based spending or guilt-free spending. You can enjoy life along the way. You spend things not on what other people think are valuable, but on what you think are valuable. I like to buy stupid things like Etro jackets. They're expensive Italian-made jackets, but I love them. I love to spend money on, you know, anything that has to do with the four gyms that I unnecessarily need. I have a gym at the cabin, a gym out the door here, and then I have a gym in the garage, and I have a gym at my other office. Yeah. But I like it. It makes me feel good, right? I, if, I, if I take it from that account, no big deal. I'm not borrowing money. I'm just, I'm just spending money on things that really light up my life right now right? That could be anything from really nice dinners or whatever it might be, whatever your personal preferences are. So pay yourself first, 
have another account where you're enjoying life along the way and living wealthy along the way because Benjamin Franklin said wealth isn't the man that has it, but the man that lives it. Mm -hmm. And then find ways that you can plug the leaks, boost your bottom line, keep more of what you make to fund those accounts. Now, once you've done that, don't just go invest in things that you don't know anything about. If you don't have cash flow from your retirement plans, you don't know how your retirement plans earns, earns and you're just hoping that it works out long term. Now it's time to invest in yourself. Expose your skill sets. Find out ways you can be more productive and make more money. Yep. Whether that's attending events, whether that's hiring coaches, whether that's you know daily rich. There's so many ways to invest in yourself. But for me, figure out your investor DNA. What is it that you understand? Some people love real estate. Other people abhor it. Some people love buying businesses. Other people don't understand it. Not many people understand the stock market yet. Masses invest in that. You know, Andrew Carnegie said he put all his eggs in one basket and watch it like a hawk. So my belief is discover your investor DNA and only invest in what you know and keep everything else safeguarded and as safe as possible and focus on cash flow first. So I've given a lot of practical pieces within there. Yeah, that, that, I love it. I love it. I mean, the peace of mind account is huge. I remember when, when we first got, my, my wife and I first got that in place. Oh my God. I mean, <laughs> talk about stress relief, right? And then you, because you have to ask the question, how does that stress that you're otherwise going to be feeling impact everything else? I mean, the peace of mind is huge. And I think it's often underrated when, when individuals are just looking at uh, the rate of return, right? Um, so that's a huge one. And then as well, uh, I'm, I'm loving this idea. And this would be a great next step for me, right? This, uh, this, this wealth uh, account of being able to, you know, purchase the things and invest in things that, that bring, again, bring that value uh, to my own life experience um, that, I can, that I can really uh, enjoy life on that level. I mean, huge, huge. Yeah, I, I, have this, I have this client. It's not a normal client. He was a friend first. And so we ended up working with him for about three years. He's worth a lot of money, a lot more than I normally like to work with because it just makes things ultra complex. They're getting hit with so many ideas every day and they've got so many people on their team. But here's a guy who's worth just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars and lives like a pauper. Like just, you know, and so I figured out this strategy uh, with one of my advisors that if we got him a plum American Express credit card and did the inventory purchases on that versus how he was buying it, it would add $150,000 of cash to his account every month. But I made a deal with them. I said, look, I'm going to tell you about this strategy. But before I do, you have to take 10% of the money that I'm going to put into your life here with no risk. And you have to spend it on yourself. You got 90 days every time to spend it. And what's hilarious is he goes, I don't even know what I'd spend it on. And I go, well, if you're asking, let me be so bold as to make some suggestions. Saw you on TV, you need a new wardrobe, bro. Like that stuff's been out of style for a long time. I'm going to hook you up with a personal shopper. You're going to Nordstrom's. There was the first 15 grand. By the way, the dude loved what he bought. He didn't know there was even different collars and wrinkle-free shirts. And, and so he went nuts. And the next thing I know, when I went and visited him, he bought a brand new sound system and a Nest system for his entire home to control all the temperature from his phone and the wall. And, like, and this was when it was brand new back then. And like, the next thing I know is like he's spending 15 grand a month, which is such a fraction of what he made, but he felt so much wealthier so much better. He was enjoying life along the way, which meant he became more productive in every other area of his life. So, so that's what the living wealthy account can do. Beautiful. Beautiful. It's such a big one. I mean, and, and, and I have, I've had clients who, who have had that particular issue, right. Where they they're actually afraid to spend money. And, and <laughs> I mean, that's a huge, I mean, I, I, that has not been my, my issue, but my God, you know, um, what kind of life is that, right? I mean, what kind of life is that? So that's an, that's an awesome story. Thank well, you. so Garrett, what, I mean, we've got a few more minutes here. So what other tips, tricks, uh, practical pieces, or, or even mindset pieces do you feel like are really key for men, again, men in midlife transitions? Um, any, other, any other tips, tricks, mindsets that you want to share? I mean, part of investing in yourself is just having like a daily morning ritual, I think, so you start your day on the right foot. Yeah. You know, that's, body, mind, and spirit, whether it's exercise, education, and personal enlightenment, like there's different terminology that we could use for it. But look, in, I did radio for years and years. And when I, would, when I would interview people, I'd find out the majority of these people that were pretty happy had these morning rituals. And so I think that that's extraordinarily practical, especially because it kind of puts on an armor abundance 
when the world's trying to throw scarcity at you, it's going to ping off of you. So, so I, I think that's important. I think that um, very practically, as much as this is like kind of financially, it's more just a life strategy is I think that it's important to do this like inventory of relationships and inventory of your daily life. Mm-hmm. So the inventory of relationships is I like to put people in three categories, friends, these are people I invite in my life. I say yes to their invitations as much as I can. And uh, I'm willing to do business with them. They're just like, they're just, it's a good situation. Friendly. These are people that I don't share the same values. I don't share the same perspective. Um, I might be blood related to some of them. I might be, you know, people that uh, I used to be friends with, but now they're just toxic in my life. I don't go have an altercation. I just start politely saying no to all their invitations. And I never invite them to anything because I want to reserve that time for my friends. Yeah. And then buddies, the third category of buddies might be just people I like to hang out with, but I'm not going to share my vision. They don't really care about the books I write or this philosophy that I might espouse. They just want to hang out and have a beer. And that's cool too. I just want to spend more time with friends, a lot less with friendly and some with buddies. And just that simple thing opens up a lot of possibility. Now, if you look at your calendar every day at the end of the day and go, does this calendar represent the man I want to be? Am I doing things that are worthy of my time, that are calling me forward in a powerful way. And you just start thinking of one of four things. Should I collaborate on anything that I'm doing? Should I delegate anything that I'm doing? Should I eliminate anything I'm doing? Or should I recreate what I'm doing with new space? And if you just ask those four questions, you could really transform your level of profitability, productivity, and enjoyment and engagement by doing that on a regular basis. Mm. Love it. Love it. The morning routine is a huge one, right? That's one I've, I've adopted for the last, I don't know, seven, eight years. Oh my God. When I first started that, it changes so much. Uh, I'm curious, are you willing to share your personal morning routine? Yeah. And, uh, you know, like let's, I'll give you the version A and version B. So okay. version A happens sometimes. And that's where I like, I'll get up, I'll put on my new calm. I don't know if you're familiar with new calm, put you in a parasympathetic state. And I do like this whole check through of life of what am I grateful for? What can I love about myself? And then I might even do my breathe plus app for 12 minutes after that, work on some uh, heart rate variability. After that, I'll probably pull out my five minute journal. I'll write three things I'm grateful for, three intentions for the day and a declaration for life. And then from there, I'll hit the gym. I'll do a workout. And then while I'm getting ready, I listen to some type of podcast or audio that's really inspiring. Now, I do that 20% of the time. (laughs) <laughs> the other 80% of the time, this is what it looks like. Okay. I get up, I take 15 minutes by doing some dishes, cleaning up the, the main part of the house, making espresso, you know, um, listen to some sports talk, right. you know, and finally, like, come out of that. Now, I finally get my workout in. I get my workout in, and then I'll do a little something like the five-minute journal. I skip meditation, or I do a very short meditation you know, like five to five minutes, 10 minutes, and then I'm off for the day. So it's progress over perfection. Done is better than perfect. Um, you know, sometimes I have those extraordinary multiple hour ones, but for most of the time, I'm just making sure to get a workout in. If I'm not working out that day, then I might just be doing a little bit of like foundation training, which is kind of like yoga ish type of thing or, or something that way. And I like to take every, you know, five or six days off where I'm just sleeping in or, or relaxing a little bit or something like that, you know, hanging out with my wife. So I don't feel like it's something that I got to grind into or make it like this serious effort. It's just something where I'm creating progress each morning and I'm not in the busyness of the world. Yes. Beautiful, beautiful progress over perfection. That's what it is. It's so funny. I mean, that's, that's actually quite similar to mine and it's quite similar to what I encourage clients to do. Um, you know, when I'm working with clients coming to me asking, okay, how can you help me discover my purpose? One of the very first things they have them do is, all right, let's get on, get you on track with a solid morning routine. And it doesn't have to be perfect, right? Which nope. is, which is what you're also saying about our relationship with finances. You know, it's not, I'm hearing that it's not about perfection. It's about that, that, that consistent progress. And as yep. whether it's, you know, investment rates or, you know, how we're relating to ourselves, uh, we, we got to have that consistent progress over time. Totally. Excellent. Well, this is beautiful. This is beautiful. So, Anything else at all that you'd like to share? Um, we've had a great conversation. I'm so appreciating, Garrett, how, uh, how, how you're linking in real wealth with purpose. I mean, that's, that's clearly one of my big intentions for this summit. 
is to inspire and motivate and encourage men in midlife to step into their great calling. So I'm absolutely loving um, the connection here. Anything else uh, that you want to say on, on that note? So we know the solution to so much is value creation. The question is, what is value and how do you create it? So what is value? Value is perspective. It's not our perspective. Value is perspective for us. But what other people value is up to them. So what I found is if you want to create more value, there's an equation behind it. So financial capital is one form of capital. It's like a byproduct of these two more precious forms of capital. One being our mental capital, which is our ideas, knowledge, wisdom, tools, strategies, insights, information, right? And when we multiply that with our relationship capital, subscribers, tribe, networks, family, friends, you know, clients, customers, you, you name it. It's like, it's what the bridge between the two is business. And when we serve others, when we solve problems and we deliver that value, we make more money. So if you have a money problem right now, that's just a symptom. It's a symptom of the wrong mental capital or the wrong relationship capital. So who are you spending your time with? Are you reaching enough people? Are you more deeply impacting the people you do reach? And have you really refined what you're offering in the world and get clear about it? So, you know, just, just investigate. You might be one idea or one relationship away from the next level of prosperity. Um, and so you don't have to have all the resources. You don't have to be resourceful. And, it, you know, it doesn't take money to make money. It takes value creation. So the way we create value is mental and relationship capital. And I would argue or at least say the majority of people have a lot of potential stored inside of relationships. Yes. They're not good at asking for support. They're not good at, you know, saying what they're up to. They do too much on their own. And that goes back to that, those four things I said, collaboration, delegation, elimination, or creation, right? So that's what you want to consistently look at and then just find out, like, focus over diversification. Focus on your mental capital. Deliver that to as many people as possible or just really deeply impact those people that you serve or a combination of the two, and the byproduct is going to be money. Yeah, beautiful. Well, and again, uh, so loving the, your message around slowing down and investigating, right? What is really happening in my life? How, how, what changes need to be made? I mean, it's so easy for all of us, I mean, myself included, to get into that autopilot mode, right? Where we're just chugging along and the next thing we know, we look back and, oh my God, what's happened with my life? So what, what an absolutely uh, empowering message that is, Yeah. Well, this has been beautiful, Garrett. I, uh, I'm, I'm so inspired by this time, feeling really alive and, and excited. And, and you've given me lots of good ideas moving forward on my own path towards wealth and prosperity. Um, if individuals are, are inspired and motivated and they're wanting to learn more about you and your work, um, what next steps can they take? Probably me giving them some of that work. I mentioned killing sacred cows and it wasn't like a shameless pitch to go sell more books because honestly, selling books doesn't really make a big impact on my bottom line, but it builds relationships. So I've got this thing, wealthfactory.com forward slash mega kit, M-E-G-A-K-I-T. And inside of there, you can get two of my books. What would the Rockefellers do as it on me, killing sacred cows on me. You can also get a cash recovery toolkit. You know, when I talked about those four eyes, so you can start to integrate that and a financial strengths checklist to find out where you, you might want to pay some attention. And it's kind of like a stress test to know what's going on in your life. And so you can grab those things on me and build a relationship. You know, you obviously end up subscribing to uh, Wealth Factory, and we send um, you know we send emails on a on a pretty regular basis, at least weekly. And you know, every now and again, we offer things on that. So we're gonna offer something to you. Feel free to buy it. If not, enjoy the free resources that we gave you, and you know, unsubscribe at any time. Uh, no hard feelings. I'd love to build a relationship and add some value. So WealthFactory.com forward slash Mega Kit. I feel like uh, we're probably giving away more than uh, most people would recommend, but I just, I, if I'm gonna get a million people liberated in this world where they're economically independent and embracing financial freedom, well, I've gotta reach out to a lot of people and I gotta do that in a really compelling way. So I'm, I'm putting my uh, money where my mouth is, so to speak. Wanna master your money? Wanna figure out the things that you could do to improve your finances? Click here and check out more videos like this on Money Matters.